I'm going to take my mask off while I talk so you can hear me. Um, we're very happy to see so many of you here today for our um, event this evening. Uh, my name is Rebecca Clothy. I am the interim department head in the Department of Global Studies and Modern Languages. And I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to our event. And I just want to mention, uh, give a couple thank yous before we begin. First of all, um, this event, the program today, was funded by a Global Teach Connect grant. And the Global Teach Connect grant is funded by the US Department of Education Eiffel Title VI Award to the University of Pennsylvania, Middle East and South Asia Area Studies Centers, and Drexel University School of Education. And the two um, PIs of that grant are Jennifer Adams and Joyce Pittman, who are both in the back. And they gave the award to the three of us, Samil Nili, Naramata, and myself, who are organizing this event this evening. And I also want to thank our speakers, who I will uh, introduce momentarily, and also welcome any teachers, K-12 teachers, who may be here today, because this is a specific event designed for outreach to the um, education system. Any teachers who are not here today might be watching it later on YouTube because the event is being recorded and will be made publicly available. So today we have two special guests. Um, we have Hind Ahmad Zaki and we have Sean Yum. Sean Yum is an associate professor of political science at Temple University. He is a specialist on regimes and governance in the Middle East, especially in Arab monarchies like Jordan, Kuwait, and Morocco. His research engages topics of authoritarian politics, democratic reforms, and economic development in these countries, as well as their implications for U.S. foreign policy. His publications include the books From Resilience to Revolution, How Foreign Interventions Destabilized the Middle East, published by Columbia University Press in 2016, as well as The Political Science of the Middle East, Theory and Research Since the Arab Uprisings, published by Oxford University Press in 2022. And he also has published articles in a variety of print journals like Comparative Political Studies, European Journal of International Relations, Studies in Comparative International Development, etc. Um, Hind Ahmed Zaki is an assistant professor of political science with a joint appointment in the Department of Language, Culture, and Literature at the University of Connecticut. She is a specialist in comparative politics with an emphasis on gender and politics in the Middle East and North Africa. Her research focuses on theories of state feminism, feminist movements, gender-based violence, and qualitative research methods. Her current book project draws on more than three years of multi-sided ethnographic fieldwork, archival research, and participatory action research as feminist practice, praxis to comparatively analyze the politics of women's rights in shifting political contexts where state agents are often perpetrators of gender-based violence. Obviously, they are both experts in their field. We also have two wonderful moderators, Amel Milli, who is one of our Arabic language instructors, and she's currently teaching one of the courses in our Middle, Middle East and North Africa Studies minor, as well as Nada Mata, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Global Studies and Modern Languages with a joint appointment in the Department of Sociology. She's also the director of our Middle East and North Africa Studies minor program. And if you're interested in that program and you're not registered already for it, we have brochures about it on the table in the back. So please enjoy the cookies, the snacks, the drinks and enjoy our program this evening. And now I will turn it over to Sean, Amel, and Nada. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Thank you all to uh, the Drexel community for having me here. Um, I'm uh, very impressed you're serving like water and juice and cookies at Temple. I don't think anyone's brave enough to serve food <laughs> and beverages yet at indoor events, at least uh, not until next fall. So it's nice to see life returning uh, to a, a bit of normalcy. Uh, so the, the event today will focus on the dual themes of democracy and gender in the Middle East and North Africa and since the Arab Spring. And what my presentation will do is focus a bit more on the democracy side, giving you a brief overview of what the region looked like on the eve of the Arab Spring, 
uh, the, or, or what we call the 2011 and 2012 Arab uprisings, uh, how the region has progressed then if our benchmark of success is regime change towards democracy through local grassroots struggle, uh, and then give you uh, some parting insights about why despite some of the very bad news that often emanates from the region, and in particular the Arab world, which I focus on, uh, we shouldn't lose hope about the prospects for further democratic change um, in the Arab world. Uh, so uh, these pictures are very well-known, iconic images of what we thought back in 2011 and 12, and really starting in Tunisia in December 2010, was this generational moment for democracy. Uh, and uh, these images were seared into my imagination, and in 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 not just an emotional, but a professional sense. You see, I began teaching at Temple. I took my job at Temple as a professor of political science in uh, fall 2010. And uh, it was not long after <laughs> I took up that position that the Jasmine Revolution or the first political, uh, you know, unarmed insurrections for democracy happened in Tunisia, then spread elsewhere in the uh, Arab world. I poignantly recall how quickly things spread in uh, these protests for democracy and dignity and justice spread because my, I, I teach a very popular class at Temple called Middle East Politics, and I'd spent some time in Tunisia for my dissertation research uh, d during the last years of the Ben Ali dictatorship. He ruled from 1987 till you know, uh, 2010. Uh, and uh, I had a brilliant presentation in that class uh, just right in November 2010. I remember this very poignantly. Uh, it was a, an entire week devoted to why authoritarian regimes were so durable and stable and why people didn't protest. And the entire week's lecture was on Tunisia. Um, and so a month passes and Tunisia becomes ground zero of the Arab uprisings. So it taught me that things on the ground move far more rapidly than we often give them credence for. Um, the democratic moment, as we believed it to be back in 2011 and 12, entailed what we now call the Arab Spring, or what I prefer, and many political scientists prefer to call the Arab uprisings. The Arab uprisings of those two years uh, constituted an unpredicted, because very few people actually prophesied them, historical insofar that the sheer frequency of protest was a generational event and convergent wave of protests and strikes and marches and rallies and sit-ins, insurrections and rebellions for political change. Across the region, as political scientists like myself observed, uh, complacent dictators were surprised at such mass mobilization because these, this wave of contestation had three qualities that very relatively few observers had theorized about before. One was speed. We did not anticipate protests spreading so quickly across the region. They began in Tunisia in December 2010, and then they quickly spread to Egypt, Libya, Syria, Jordan, Morocco, Bahrain, uh, and other countries. Dictators as well as Western observers were also surprised at uh, the similarity of these protests. Protesters often use the same slogans, strategies, and demands for dignity and justice when confronting their leaders. If you, there are plenty of YouTube videos uh, uh, that, that, that capture the emotion, the, the emotive fervor of the moment. And if you look at those videos now, as you can, and compare, say, the protests of Libya starting in February or March 2011 to the Bahraini Revolution of February and March of the same year, the January 25th uprising at Tahrir Square in Egypt, uh, the March 24th movement of Jordan, you will often find the same rhythmic chants and the same slogans being used by activists, very few of whom had met one another, but were borrowing from the same repertoire of contestation and resistance. And third, we were all surprised at ideology, or rather the lack thereof, because there was no uniting ideology to these uprisings. Uh, for a long time, scholars and observers and journalists of the Middle East believe that if there was going to be a revolutionary moment, it would be led by Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood or perhaps leftist organizations or 
uh, nationalist parties and formally organized opposition forces and parties and organizations. And that was not the case. The 2011 and 12 uprisings were led by grassroots movements, uh, grassroots movements and activists, including a number of very young participants who had never protested and demonstrate before. And the result of, uh, of that convergent wave of resistance were images that for many of us who watched them unfold in real time were seared into our memory. The uprising of Egypt, uh, the demands for democracy in Tunisia, the uh, Bahraini revolution, uh, which is often forgotten now, but as, like, uh, as I like to tell my students, we should remember happened in a very small kingdom with a tiny citizenship uh, with a tiny citizenry, which creates a very uh, interesting historical uh, sort of uh, uh, factoid. Uh, at the height of the Bahraini Revolution, before it was suppressed uh, in, in, in March 2011, there were 100 to 110,000 Bahrainis protesting on the street against their regime, the ruling Khalifa monarchy. Now, Bahrain at the time, had a citizenship population, not counting migrants and uh, expatriate workers and labor, a, citizen a citizenship population of 550,000, which meant that in terms of human history, this was one of the greatest displays of people power ever. Right? Most revolutions never involved more than 1% of a national population mobilizing for change. Here it was one in five. Right? We have never seen the scale of this in proportional terms. In 2011, Time Magazine proclaimed the protester as their person of the year, right? Now, there were a number of reasons why things didn't go as many of us ebullient optimists hoped, why there was no democratic wave. And one reason is that by 2013 and 2014, what we saw was a concerted pushback, or what we now call a counter-revolutionary strategy on part of many surviving authoritarian regimes against popular mobilization. We saw as well an outburst of civil wars, uh, some fueled by counter-revolutionary forces and often amplified by foreign interventions, which in certain countries like Yemen and Syria and Libya muddied the waters of democracy and protest. And finally, we saw a very weak level of global support for local democratic movements. Outside Tunisia, which until recently was often seen as a success story of the Arab Spring, since it experienced not a perfect decade of democracy, but at least a marked change in political institutions involving relatively competitive elections and uh, re relatively free political pluralism after 2011 outside Tunisia, there was remarkably little international assistance for democratization, particularly from Washington. I want to briefly walk you through some of these factors we saw by the mid-2010s, because that will lead us to the current day and uh, uh, give us some insight into why we might see, I think, another wave of democratic protest emerging soon. By counter-revolution, I mean a number of Arab states, including the Gulf Kingdoms, all of whom survived the Arab Spring, sought to inoculate themselves against what they saw as the contagion of democracy by coordinating their policies of foreign aid and military interventions. I mean, the Saudi and Emirati war in Yemen is probably exhibit, like exhibit A of that. There were a number of other regimes, uh, like the one I know really well, the, that of the Hashemite monarchy of Jordan, that simply doubled down and repressed protest movements or promised empty reforms that didn't lead anywhere. So many of these surviving regimes simply bided their time and hoped that the, 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 the demand for democracy would fade. And then the other count, another countervailing factor was the preeminence of conflict, particularly in Libya, Yemen, and Syria, which resulted in some horrendous civil wars, although through very different pathways. They, they, they shouldn't be lumped together. In Libya and Yemen, leaders did actually lose power to mass mobilization, but con competing factions and external interventions in the subsequent years after 2012, 2013, scuttled a transitional framework to democratic statehood. And most of the world didn't help matters by not providing, I think, sufficient levels of, dem of, of democratic support. In Syria, as we know, 
the Assad regime refused to seek ground, and then ISIS became a thing. And by the end of 2015, 2016, there were multiple overlapping foreign, uh, foreign interventions by at least half a dozen external actors and agents and powers, resulting in what we now know as the abattoir of Syria, whose pre-war population of 20 million has been rendered profoundly, I think, uh, traumatized with 6.5 million internally displaced peoples and nearly 7 million refugees outside their borders. So essentially, two out of three Syrians, uh, you know, between 2011 and now, have at some point been forced to leave their home or their country because of war. And finally, there was very little global support. Uh, while many governments around the world evoked moral support for these grassroots struggles for democracy, what I found, and I think many other scholars found disconcerting, were that Western powers like the US were at best lukewarm to the prospects of Arab democratization given certain prevailing strategic interests that I don't think need to be discussed too thickly because I think many of us know what they are. A, uh, a, 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 a region filled with Arab democracies whose foreign policies and leadership identities couldn't be shaped or cajoled or incentivized in Western capitals is not one necessarily that abides by the long-term strategic visions of those who want to, in their mind, guarantee the free flow of oil, to guarantee Israeli security, and to uh, in induce what they see as a successful Western-driven counter-terrorist uh, strategy. And so outside of Tunisia's then successful transition, uh, the West provided very little aid and support to democratic voices on the ground. Uh, this graphic is from The Economist in 2016, and it shows that outside of Tunisia, which is colored blue, it shows a, 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 an Arab world that didn't end up in a way that we thought it would in 2011 and 12. I mean, countries which are, which are in this graphic, you know, shaded orange, are what the economists called then full autocracies. If you were green, you were a autocracy slash restricted democracy, which to my mind doesn't mean much. A restricted democracy, I think, is just a, a conceptual uh, red herring. It simply means that you're not as bad as, say, uh, the UAE or Qatar or Saudi Arabia, which sets the, the benchmark pretty, <laughs> pretty low, I think. Um, and then Syria, Libya, and Yemen, as we know, were then and now remain mired um, and civil conflict. So in the final uh, few slides of my presentation, I want to leave you with a few insights and I think reasons for hope, however, and traction for thinking about, I think, the, the aperture for further democratic change in the region. By the mid to late 2010s, if you were a political scientist, you were seeing a profundity of books being published, some, some by fellow scholars, others by, you know, <laughs> commentators um, that were called, say, the Arab winter. I mean, th this was a just a maddening, infuriating sort of metaphor that came after the Arab Spring, which in my mind was also a misleading metaphor. Uh, Noah Feldman, who you know many of us know, wrote a book called The Arab Winter. A colleague of mine at Georgetown, Stephen King, wrote The Arab Winter. Uh, some guy I don't know wrote from, <laughs> from Arab Spring to Islamic Winter. This was par for course by the mid to late 2010s. And the idea being evoked by a number of academicians was that the democratic moment is over. We had our chance in 2011 and 12. Then bad things happened. The Muslim Brotherhood didn't behave. The Assad regime happened. ISIS exploded. The West lost its moment. It is done. But the problem is, there were a number, there are, there remain a number of ongoing dynamics that give us profound reason, I think, to continue expecting that people will not stay still and the struggle for democracy through, gra through grassroots contestation will continue. The first is these walls of fear which previously bound citizens to obeisance in authoritarian regimes continue to crack. And I think the greatest piece of evidence is that a second wave of uprisings erupted in 2019 and 20, interrupted, I think, only by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in Algeria and Sudan, new popular movements forced sitting presidents to surrender power, and they also, for, they also toppled 
the Prime Minister of Iraq. A renewed protests for dignity and justice exploded in places like Morocco, Jordan, Lebanon, and Egypt. So the cycle continues. Number two, and penultimately, youth activists continue to mobilize. And this is very important, I think, because much of my research engages youth activism on the ground in places like Kuwait and Jordan. And this is what I have observed uh, over, the past, um, over the past several years. Activists, thinkers, and dissenters are perpetually learning from the failures of the past, and they are envisaging future change, even despite the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic. So for instance, among the lessons learned that they have told me and many other research, researchers over the last decade, number one, social media isn't enough, right? While digital technologies like Twitter were very important to coordinate protests 10 years ago, now a new generation of activists realize it's not enough to topple a ruler. Now one must organize on the ground the day after to guard the gains of a revolution to make sure, for instance, they don't end up with another Egyptian scenario. Number two, control the narrative. Activists today know more than ever that they should not let their leaders or the mainstream media, either globally or in their own countries, dictate how disobedience is framed. Imagine the images that are, for instance, uh, um, sparked in your mind if you see the words dangerous riots versus peaceful protests, even though both phrases could, talk, could, could essentially engage the same event, which is an unexpected, spontaneous, and seemingly threatening contestation against authoritarian rule. And third, change takes time. Power is intoxicating, and as we know now, autocrats do not concede power easily. Right? The Assad regime of Syria was willing to kill a considerable, non-trivial proportion of their national population so that they didn't have to surrender office. Right? We're talking about regimes where the horizon of change should be measured not by days or months, but potentially years. And for some activists, campaigns that stretch over, uh, over maybe a decade or longer. And finally, and I'll end on this point, there are structural dynamics that remain very precarious and perilous across the region. Because overall, uh, the, the, the overall picture of economic underachievement and political deprivation remains harrowing in the Arab world. So here's a factoid. Two thirds of Arabs today are under the age of 30 in the Middle East and North Africa. But the Arab world also has the highest youth unemployment rate among all global regions, 28%. It's higher than Sub-Saharan Africa. It's higher than South Asia. And this was before the COVID-19 pandemic. Right? So preliminary estimates from the World Bank suggest that that 28% is probably 35 to 38% now, which means crudely, if you are between the ages of 16 and 28 right now in the Arab world and actively looking for a job, right, there is a non-trivial chance you will fail. You will fail because economies are not pr producing enough jobs for you. Most credible public surveys also show ordinary people are extremely angry about the same abuses that plagued them a decade ago, corruption, repression, and endemic inequality. And finally, a significant part of the regional population in a humanitarian crisis remains displaced as refugees from wars or migrants, for, uh, uh, or migrants from economic crisis. I will end here simply by saying that although the last decade for democracy in the Arab world didn't turn out the way that we had hoped, particularly for wide-eyed, optimistic academics like myself, we have seen enough on the ground, particularly in the last few years, to suggest that those who are committed to change, whether it be through dignity, democracy, economic justice, demands for income redistribution, demands for enough food and bread for cheap, affordable housing, demands for better education, the cycle of protests involving those agents of change have not stopped, right? Countries have not settled down. Individuals are still mobilizing. And I think the spirit of contestation remains alive, which I hope provides a good segue to thinking about the dynamics of gender equality and gender change uh, in, the, in the Arab world. So I'll now turn it over to Hint. Um, 
Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I just wish to begin by thanking both Neda and Amal for, and everybody here for inviting me. Uh, it's very exciting to be talking again in person, uh, as Sean said. Uh, I, I was just in another conference last week, and I hadn't realized how much this pandemic had really isolated all of us. And it just feels great to be back in a room with, uh, with a lot of interested people. Uh, and have a, actually a face-to-face -face conversation. So thank you for having me. Okay, um, thank you much, very much, Sean, for the wonderful presentation. I think it will provide me, he, you made my job so much easier because I won't have to provide a lot of background information. You have done the perfect job of doing that about the Arab uprisings. That kind of sets the stage for what I'm talking about. Um, I'm gonna talk more, uh, like taking the lead from the earlier presentation, I'll be talking more about what I call mobilization for women's rights in the shadow of the Arab Springs. Um, and it's more about the question of gender that sort of really exploded uh, with the Arab Spring um, starting from 2011. And as John ended his presentation with, with the first wave of the Arab Spring and also the second wave of the Arab Spring that sort of started also in 2019. And I would say, I would dare say is ongoing. So we are, we're talking about, uh, I guess kind of taking my cue from the earlier presentation, we are discussing uh, a, a moving target really here because I don't think any of what we're saying right now uh, means that anything is settled. We are, we are in a very dynamic situation where things are fast changing on the ground. Um, same map, <laughs> I'm not surprised. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly. The only thing I am gonna point with the 2016 economics uh, uh, economist map that Sean had already talked about is Tunisia. So I wish to kind of like bring your attention a little bit to the little blue dot up there with 10.8 uh, million people. I think it's more, I think the population of Tunisia is more now uh, they were they were wrong about this anyway, but I uh, but uh, uh, which has the only blue dot here, right? Uh, that was in 2016, of course, and I know that a lot of people right now who are following the Middle East are kind of apprehensive about the status of Tunisia. Uh, I mean, there is some definite backsliding when it comes to democracy there, but I want to talk about Tunisia in particular because I think Tunisia represents a very important and interesting case when it comes to women's rights in the Middle East, and it can provide us with a lot of interesting links uh, about gender in the Middle East, uh, sorry, about the relationship between democracy and women's rights in the, in the region in general. But I wish first to bring your attention to these two pictures. Again, um, both dating from, I think this is from 2011 in Egypt, the one on the left, and this is from 2012 in Tunisia. And these are women protesting, uh, both are women protests, uh, left Egypt, right Tunisia. The women protest in, in Tunisia, um, and for those of you, some of you might read Arabic and some might not, so I'm just going to translate roughly what's on the banners here. It says, no going back to authoritarianism or going back to repression, and no, no uh, compromise on the rights and liberties, on the rights and gains of Tunisian women. And then in Egypt here, in the midst of the uprising that kind of turned quickly deadly with the military dispersing uh, the protesters in 2011, which was kind of a, a pretty preview for what would happen later in 2013, of course, with the um, crushing of the Egyptian uprising, the, uh, rule, the return of military rule, the coup d'etat against the democratically elected government in June 2013, and uh, the uh, return to military, uh, to military rule practically. Uh, right now. And here we see a lot of banners um, sort of protesting military violence, particularly military violence against women's protesters, but against women in general on the streets of Egypt that became very evident and there were images of it all over the world. And it says Askar Kazibun or uh, military liar, a liar, uh, lying generals or lying military leaders and stop the violence against women. I think the pictures are often speak a thousand word, and this is why I wanted to bring us to the picture, because I'll be sp specifically talking about Egypt and Tunisia and about democracy and gender in these two countries. Of course, what I'm talking about as well applies or the approach or the, um, the point of entry or w some of the ideas that I will be sharing uh, with you today could definitely be applied to 
almost all other countries in the region as well. But I'm using these two cases in particular because I'm, uh, those are the cases that I'm most familiar with and I'm writing a book about them. So I'll share some of the insights, but those insights are definitely generalizable as well, or I would like to think they are generalizable. So um, just thinking about those images that we had just seen, um, kind of takes me back to 2011, right? Right when those uh, in amazing events were taking place, right? As Sean described them. And we were all like in awe. We were watching the news. We were very, uh, we were watching all of this. And I remember I was a graduate student at the University of Washington in Seattle back then. And um, I was ready to, you know, to go back to Cairo to join the demonstrations, which I did in early February. The uprising started in Egypt. The uprising started in, on the 25th of January. And I remember in the week I spent in the US between the start of the uprising and until I went back home to Egypt, which is where I'm originally from, the question that I kept getting asked from everyone, professors, students, um, the radio, <laughs> the Seattle radio, people on the street, oh, there are so many women on the street. We didn't even know that women could protest in Egypt. We didn't know that women could go on the street like that. Those images are amazing. And then what would follow from that? Why aren't all women, aren't all women in Egypt veiled? Aren't all women in Egypt Muslim? Um, is it a problem that women are protesting? Uh, are their husbands, are their fathers, are, are their families okay with them being out on the street? And then how does this go with Islamic Sharia? These were the questions that kept coming up and up again. And I think those questions were, a lot of people would think those questions are offensive. I actually think they are pretty justified, given the onslaught of media images that people get in the, mid, in the West and in the United States about Middle Eastern women, Muslim women, right? That Muslim women are very much oppressed and they don't do anything at all. And uh, they can't go out on the street and all of these, you know, the, the list goes on and on, right? Um, and it got me thinking about some of the approaches that we tend to think about when it comes to gender, when it comes to women's rights, right? The West and everybody was seeing those images of women and at the back of their mind, they were having all these you know, preconceived ideas and notions about women from the region, right? A lot of these preconceived notions were relating to what we tend to, to call Orientalism. Uh, the idea that people of the Orient, the idea that goes back to uh, the late Professor Edward Said, of course, who had written extensively about this idea, of uh, the idea of Orientalism as a way of understanding or making sense of the people in the Middle East in the West, right? And how the depictions of Middle Eastern, and, and the main tritsy or the main argument of Said's very famous 1978 book is that the depictions of these Middle Eastern people are not innocent, right? But they are often uh, reflecting, uh, like that the knowledge reflects power and it constitutes an ideological basis of social and political institutions of power. So it's really not about innocent images. It's really about the interest-based ideas behind those, uh, those images, right? Which was plain old colonialism, right? It, back in the days and now might be, you know, the need to uh, combat Islamic fundam fundamentalism, then, uh, which, which entails seeing MENA women or women from the Middle East as one uniform group, you know, they all kind of the same, or uh, seeing this religion and culture of the region as static, as unchanging, and seeing the political economy uh, of the country like the oil, the curse of the oil, right? These people, um, this, this, this is a region that's very rich in oil, and the oil kind of like really, because uh, the oil kind of like makes this argument that we, they are going to stay in this condition forever, right? They have no incentive to modernize economically since they have this like <laughs> huge, you know, vast, vast um, uh, copious amounts of oils uh, right there that they can just sell. And of course, this goes back to the colonial encounter and it goes back to different ideas and it takes us to the idea of representation of difference and how representing women, different women involve this idea of a social and political bias. Um, we, we might be familiar or a lot of you might be familiar with what I have just talked about. What we are less familiar about or what we not tend to think about so much 
is the other way around, is that when we tend to think of women's rights, when we tend to think of women in the Middle East, and we tend to have these images of, you know, um, uni uni of, um, of culture staticity, of oppression, we often try to jump to the other side completely, kind of like assume this identity politics uh, stance, and think about women as in the Middle East as vastly different from women from the West, right? Uh, we are against, you know, kind of like breaking all women together. Then we go on and try to kind of think about women in the Middle East also as something very special in the, in, in the way we tend to think about identity politics or in an inverse kind of identity politics way. Um, and that has its risks too, because it kind of glozes over the individual experiences of women, and it also does not, uh, and also does not uh, does not emphasize the common ground that women all over the world often have, right? And I have so much to say about this as I'm giving this talk and thinking about the U.S. right now. When I was walking here. Um, I came across a demo. I couldn't help but noticing that demonstration against the current, the leaked uh, version of the uh, Supreme Court decision about abortion. And I couldn't just help but notice that when thinking about Tunisia, a country in the Middle East that had legalized abortion since 1968, 19, abortion is legal in Tunisia and the state pays for it. Emma, Emma is noting here because she's from Tunisia. Since 1968, and we are having this conversation about women from the Middle East and women from, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's very simplistic, right? <laughs> Needless to say, this is a very simplistic narrative. Um, so instead of this very culturalist approach that I kind of like very much try to bring you away from <laughs> in the last five minutes, I hope I succeeded, I wish to invite you to look at gender uh, in the Middle East and women's rights in the Middle East from a different approach which is basically looking at the state and its formation, right? One thing that the Arab Spring had exposed, and I think Sean had mentioned, uh, had, had touched upon this, is how actually different those states are. Yes, definitely those um, Arab uprisings and Arab states share a lot, but they are kind of different types of states. And by different types of states, I'm talking about state institutions, I'm talking about modernization projects, certain projects that were taken up by the elite that built the state. And uh, also the history of colonialism, of the nationalist movement, of the state building uh, process in these countries were pretty much different. Even in areas that are pretty, you know, we would tend to think of them as one unit, like the Maghreb, for example, which often includes Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. If you look at the history of these three countries, apart from the French colonizer, apart from the fact that they were colonized by the French, you will see very different state structures. You'll see very different types of state and very different kinds of contestations, very different national movements, and very different ideas about what the state is. I wish to talk here about the state as I wish to make a point here that when I say the state, um, I don't mean one monolithic body. Uh, the state is a set of different institutions. A state is the set of various things that influence women, right? And here in my particular research, I focus on state feminism or what the state does to women, the state's policies toward women. And I focus here on four dimensions in particular. The role and motivations of those state building elites that started these states. These are new states, so you can go back and kind of like figure out what was going on in the 1950s when Tunisia gained its independence or back in the 1940s when Egypt was still a British colony, right? There's a lot written in the archives about what were people thinking, what were those state building elites thinking when they were, you know, uh, kind of fighting colonialism and building their own states, right? And so we have the role and motivations of the state elites, and of course we have the laws organizing uh, gender um, relations, particularly what is known all over the Arab and the Islamic world as the personal status code or the family codes of these countries. Those are usually the, the laws that are governing, govern, um, the laws that govern marriage and divorce and all of these things. And then finally, the state institutions that carry out those laws and those policies. And one important thing that I in, intentionally um, add to the state feminism division, which is the women's rights and the relationship to the state. And this might take us to a point that is very important here 
um, in the sense that a lot of people, again, um, think that Arab feminism or that, the, that feminism does not exist in the Arab world or that there's no women's rights movement in the Arab world. Um, Professor Nadine Neber at the University of Illinois uh, at Chapana had a wonderful TED talk that I invite you all to listen to if you have time. It's called Arab Feminism and Oxymoron. Uh, because a lot of people tend to think that the Arab world does not have feminist movements, does not have women's rights movement, and I'm here to tell you that this is not true at all and that there is a history of Arab feminism that goes as far as the late 19th century uh, in many parts of the Arab world, including Palestine, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and Tunisia, Maghreb, so many other, and, and Morocco, and so many other places. So I guess here the question that I will, uh, I will spend like the next 10 hopefully 10 minutes uh, only, and stop me if, I, if you have to, um, talking about which kind of like um, reflects on some of the, um, I'm sharing some of the findings from my current book manuscript that I'm writing on this history of state feminism and how it influenced the ability of women's rights, uh, right, women's movements and women's rights and feminist movement to mobilize for women's rights following the Arab Spring. And the purpose here is actually to show that there is a huge diversity in this region known as the Arab world. And the diversity has to do very much with the state, with those dimensions of state feminism that I talked about, but also with what uh, Tim Mitchell, who is like political scientist Tim Mitchell, often calls the state effect. The state effect is that the states or the state projects or the national state projects often have effects that goes beyond the direct uh, policies of the state. And those effects are actually the most interesting to study. How do people tend to identify themselves as citizens of a certain state, right? These may, these may seem like simple things to you, but it is what actually drives people to mobilize. It, it's, it's actually what drives citizenship or ideas of citizenship. And it what drives a lot of these women to mobilize for their rights. So when Tunisian women mobilize for their rights, they are mobilizing for their rights as Tunisian citizens they identify with a particular history of the state, or with a particular history of the state feminism. And, and this is what I call subject formation or subjectivity. That these women and these movements, and I look at that at length in my, in my, in my upcoming book, how do they actually identify as Tunisian feminists? What does it mean to be a Tunisian feminist or an Egyptian feminist back in 1950s and now? And what does, what, how do they tend to think about women's rights? Okay. And here we will find that a lot of unexpected consequences of women's mobilization can come up. So we tend to think that women are, okay, they were particularly oppressed. They definitely, they, um, uh, they all participated in the Arab Spring. A lot of them uh, marched, a lot of them were killed uh, in many of these countries, not just in Egypt and Tunisia. And yes, definitely the political, uh, result of this. They did not get much in terms of rights. They did not get much in terms of real changes in law or real political participation. They were often driven out of the political, uh, you know, uh, power. Uh, yeah, whenever, whenever we come to the real power sharing, women are usually driven out of it, right? But there's something, but even though this was very true in many, many of these countries, there was something else that happened as well, is that these women's movements flourished so much following the uprising, even in countries where the uprising was severely crushed, like Egypt, uh, like Lebanon in 2019, like Algeria right now, like Sudan right now, where women are, in 2019, from 2019 until now, where women are playing a major role in, not just in protesting, but where women's rights activism and feminism is kind of flourishing as well. So it is important to think about what do we mean by these things. And here, I think Tunisia is a very interesting case because Tunisia has this history of state feminism that goes back to the, 1950, the 1950s. Here uh, is like a picture that I love showing of uh, the late President Bourguiba, who is, who is often seen as the founding father of modern Tunisia, uh, leader of national independence, who became a president up until 1987 when he was removed by Ben Ali in a coup, in a coup d'etat. Uh, and uh, Bourguiba was a major figure along with the uh, state building elite that was with him in terms of thinking about women's rights as an integral part of the, the 
a Tunisian post-colonial state. And by that I mean that Tunisia, very early on, after gaining its independence, had a very important uh, strong national westernized elite that was very strongly invested in economic and social reforms. And women's rights featured very heavily as part of those reforms. And on the uh, most importantly uh, among that was the 1956 Personal Status Code of Tunisia, which until now is seen as a revolutionary legal document in the sense that it provided more women uh, with more rights within the sphere of marriage equality, divorce, and all other inheritance even, all other issues related to women's rights um, more than any other uh, country in the region. So uh, 19, the, the, the po when I was doing my field work in Tunisia uh, for my dissertation, people would just keep talking about the 1956 document even after 2011. So I was like interested in talking to all these women who were mobilizing in 2000 and from 2011 to 2014, um, a, a period when uh, Tunisia was rewriting its post-revolutionary constitution and women's rights were a huge part of the debate. Women were, at that time, we had a very flourishing women's rights movement in Tunisia that was fighting for women's electoral parity. Uh, let me just give you a few, a list of the few things that this women's rights movement managed to achieve between 2011 and 2016. Electoral parity. Uh, enshrined in the Constitution. Tunisia is only one of five countries in the world that has uh, an article in the Constitution that says that women should be that women should be um, elected to any elected electoral government. Fifty percent. It has to be fifty percent women. Any at any level of the electoral of the electoral. So, parliament, state council, and everything. Yes. It's far from ideal in terms of implementation until now. Political parties have, of all shades of the political spectrum, have been very resistant of it. But still, it's, it's enshrined in the Constitution. And also, um, uh, Tunisia has like uh, one of the most progressive uh, uh, laws against uh, violence against women. That was, uh, pa that was also, um, uh, that, was, that passed in 2017. Tunisia passed even a bylaw allowing Muslim women to marry non-Muslim men, which is absolutely unheard of in the rest of the Arab Spring, causing uh, uh, of the Arab countries, causing an uproar in the rest of the Arab Arab world, accusing Tunisia of not even becoming an Arab or Islamic country anymore. So I'm I'm talking about a very special case here, okay? And when I was doing my field work and up till now, I'm always wondering what makes Tunisia. What, what, first of all, who are these women's rights activists and? How come they are that great? And what created this country? Like in the middle of, <laughs> not in the middle of every, I, as I'm saying, there are very, uh, there are also very active women's rights movement elsewhere, but nobody had been that successful, right? And really the answer lies back to, or it starts from this post-colonial era. But post-colonial era, the po these legacies, what I call historical legacies, could not have worked for Tunisia hadn't it not been for this very active women's rights movement that did a number of things really here. They did this innovative framework, uh, uh, innovative framing of these past legacies in a way that would appeal to the citizen, citizen, citizenry in the context of a new democratic reality following the Arab Spring. So they would talk about how important the personal status code is how important it is, how much of a legacy of Tunisia it is, how much we need to preserve it. And this was a concentrated political effort. It wasn't just you know people saying that. They would hold marches. They would um, form groups. And they created a common national narrative of state feminism, presenting state feminism as a way of preserving the identity of Tunisia. Of course, there was a lot of fear of the Islamists coming to power and sort of backsliding a lot of these things, which actually did not happen uh, to in Nahda's um, credit. And, and actually, I do think that, because this is uh, a topic for a lot of people who study Islamic uh, movements in the, in the Middle East, like why is in Nahda kind of like moderate? I think in Nahda is moderate because they are themselves a product of the state, um, comparatively moderate, in, if we're talking about them comparing to other uh, Islamist movements elsewhere. And finally, recentering law and particularly the personal status code as part of this narrative. So I'm not going to go much 
uh, in details. I don't have much time to talk about Egypt, which is my other case, but I would love to, I would be more than happy to take questions about Egypt or any other cases in the Q&A because I want us to talk uh, more in the Q&A. But what I wanted to say is that, what I wanted to end up with is that states are very important, state policies and these four dimensions that I mentioned are super important for us when we try to understand women's rights. It's not enough to think about culture. It's not enough to think about Islam. Um, Islam is something, again, Islam is mean, is, it, the applications of Islam, what Islamic Sharia means, is very different even among these countries. Some countries, like Tunisia, allow polygamy, uh, sorry, outlaw polygamy. Other countries completely would, would not think of that, right? They would think of that as completely against Islam. These are not simply theological conversations or debates. I think they are a, a reflection or a result or a product of these particular historical, uh, uh, historical uh, legacies and historical, uh, you know, like all the state's historical attempts to reform these things. And those are different projects with different intentions and with different meanings. And I think it's important to understand women's rights and the story of women's rights in the Middle East as part of that. And also to give some agency to these women's rights groups and movements in the region, women's mobilization have also shaped state feminism. So it's not that they are passive recipients of that, but they also have, have also uh, shaped uh, this, these projects, these status projects of state feminism and had been shaped by it in ways that had curtailed and expanded women's rights in different ways. I'll stop here, but I am more than happy to discuss any of the cases in more details or any of the other ca uh, countries in the, in the region, if you wish. Thank you. I need to? I'm yeah, speaking yeah. loud. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so again, thank you, Sean and Hint, for these excellent um, lectures and, uh, and comments. Um, I'm, I was really glad that you both sort of addressed this question that as professors in US uh, academia always have to deal extensively with the role of Islam and culture and both explaining democracy and uh, gender inequality. I think, Hind, what you said about sort of these opposites of um, trying not to be stereotypical and saying, oh, it's their culture, they're different, is also actually um, in, in some way orientalist. And I think we shouldn't shy away from looking at universal um, interests and rights that women have across the world. Um, and it's not easy to bring that uh, in class always. There's, there's uh, resistance to that and some academics also don't, uh, as we know, kind of um, accept this. So I'm very glad you brought these um, ideas again to, uh, we have a lot of students here, so this is uh, very important to think about uh, similarities also across the world, also in terms of democracy also in terms of uh, gender. I do want to ask, I'll ask uh, two uh, questions uh, that are related really to, and, and, and again, there's an emphasis on structural factors, on state policies, very uh, kind of things that influence um, democratic change and gender rights all across the world, as we know from also the US uh, experience um, uh, historically and currently. And so I want to ask about, um, uh, Sean, for Sean, you talked about sort of the um, the lessons from the uprisings. And so I was wondering if you can say, uh, what do the movements need to do, if we can learn from other democracies, in order to be able to push against these very, very ferocious autocratic regimes that have militaries behind them and have uh, global support, particularly the US? Uh, what, what movements do? Um, at the beginning of the uprising, if we looked at youth movements like in, I, I work in Egypt, so I know more about Egypt, they were shied away from uh, pol political parties, they were kind of talking about the beauty of horizontal power, uh, and that influenced other movements across the world, and now we know that this kind of, <laughs> when, when you need to confront aut autocracies, that's a problem. So I was wondering what you think, sort of these movements, what, what do they need to do? We know that they're constantly, there's constant people until this day being very um, 
courageous <laughs> and uh, posting on Facebook and going to jail and trying to protest and going to jail. So it's actually unbelievable in spite of all the despair and uh, what you know Arab uh, youth and, and people in general still try to do to democratize. So this is a very similar question to Hind. I was wondering if you can say something about where did these women got their leverage from to influence the process. There's a lot of talk in Tunisia about the official union federation, the UGTT, and um, it pushed back against the Nahda. And at least this is what I read. I don't do research on Egypt. It pushed back against the Nahda's kind of trying to um, uh, take away from uh, the social rights that you described that they gained in previous era. Um, so is, is the women's movement connected to UGTT? We know that Tunisia in particular has higher levels of labor force participation, uh, different than other countries. So where, what, is the, what did they do? Could you tell us a little bit more about how were they able to do it? Thank you. OK, great. Um, this, is, this is on, right? OK. Uh, I, I'll just I'll answer uh, Nana's question uh, first and, and just say that I think um, in speaking to activist colleagues of mine in places like Morocco and Jordan, Lebanon and Kuwait, uh, one of the enduring takeaways from their vision of change in these countries, whether it's through bottom-up revolution or gradual reform or just nudging their rulers or their, whether it's a, the, the king or a you know, decrepit <laughs> president to, to, to decide on things better, one of the enduring takeaways is that they need, they, they, they are working, it's twofold. One, they are actively working on uh, creating more of a boomerang effect. And by that, what, by that I mean, uh, in 2011 and 12, when the first wave of the Arab uprisings erupted, uh, they, the, the global media covered these uprisings as these quotidian, spontaneous struggles that were surprising because everyone thought in classic neo-orientalist fashion that everyone must have been happy with dictatorship in the Middle East because how come there were no revolutions before? Actually, there were plenty of revolutions before. They were just brutally suppressed. And the absence of protest does not mean quiescence or acceptance of injustice. Right? I mean, in any given time, in this country, for instance, every person of color is not protesting. But that has nothing to do with the grotesqueness of racial injustice in America. Right? It does not, that the size of a protest does not indicate the depth of injustice in a country. <laughs> Although it can be a good sort of benchmark after the fact. So, you know, by discarding all those, I, I, at least in that moment, uh, by discarding all those stereotypes, global media opined in and said, in many ways, it encaged people like, like Hind and myself and not on other observers who were trying to theorize about these protests and think this is the start of a new campaign for change and instead, uh, the media narrative was, here are these uncontrollable insurrections and Lord forbid that the Islamists take over tomorrow. Um, and one thing that youth activists, and they did this better in, I think, Algeria and Sudan in 2019 and 2020, certainly in Lebanon uh, in 2019, and again after the port explosion in, in Beirut, um, not long after the 2019 financial crisis there. Uh, the boomerang effect means that activists locally are able to engage transnational movements around the world and broadcast their struggle and plights and connect it to injustices elsewhere and around, around the world in hopes that those transnational movements, particularly those embedded in the West, will put pressure on their governments to recognize those movements back in the Middle East and to empower them and to support them with aid and assistance, and if nothing else, with diplomatic recognition. Um, I think there's a greater recognition, there, there's a greater understanding among activists today that they have to do that, that local struggles are never truly disconnected from the broader global arc of injustice, and that if you're fighting for, say, democracy in Jordan, or fighting for, say, uh, say provincial rights in the Reef, 
which is an underserved region uh, in Morocco, or you're fighting for, say, economic justice and the end of confessional sectarian patronage in a place like Lebanon, then it's not enough to say this is a uniquely Lebanese struggle, that there are other struggles and contestations around the world that you have to connect to, and in return, those movements will help you back. And we actually saw a glimmer of this in 2011 and 12. Um, I know many of the students in the room are probably too young to remember this, but there was a movement in many, starting primarily in the US, but spreading somewhat to other countries, right? The Occupy movement. Uh, that was inspired partly by the Arab Spring. And there was this apocryphal moment that actually was verified to me and that, that, that sociologists and scholars of contentious politics find really fascinating um, of, of local Occupy protesters in places like Philadelphia and New York actually not knowing how to deal with police repression. Because if you're a college student, then what do you do when the police fire tear gas in your face? Right, so what happened was activists all across the world, including Arab activists, those who were fresh off their victory in Tahrir Square in Egypt, reached out to American activists and said, there are actually a dozen ways that you can make a homemade gas mask. Right, <laughs> let us school you on how to fight for <laughs> justice and democracy. So it was kind of like the, uh, it was this, 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 weird inversion of power dynamic where those from the global south were actively instructing their privileged peers in global north. So this is how you fight. And you know, this is, this is for real. Uh, the, the, the stakes are, high. this is not something fun you do after you know, your econ exam, right? Like you could lose your life in this struggle. Um, and I think those linkages are really important. I think the second and final thing that activists know is that they have to organize better, uh, particularly uh, after, you know, if a protest succeeds. And by that I mean, I think a lot of, uh, of what we will call now um, the so-called secular or civic activists who are not followers of the Muslim Brotherhood, the, uh, the so-called Daula Medania trend in Egypt, the civil state opposition in Egypt whose vision of a post uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak, the dictator who, who, who lost power in 2011, a post-Mubarak order would be one governed not by the Muslim Brotherhood or even a coalition involving the Islamists, but rather a secular coalition of leftists and nationalists and, and, and youth-based parties. I think the lesson they learned uh, is, is, is from that lost moment for democracy is that just because you remove a leader from power doesn't mean the struggle is done. Right, because there are deeply entrenched levers of state power, whether it's the military or it is conservative elites or octogenarians who don't want to give up their generations long privileges because they own businesses, they own bureaucracies, they are part of the state that you have to dislodge as well. Um, and we see this playing out in Algeria and Sudan now. The presidents of Algeria and Sudan two years ago, or in, in the last one to two years, they resigned from office. I mean, Sudan, it was more of like an internal coup, but they lost power on account of mass contestation. But democracy still hasn't transpired because military institutions in these countries are still resistant to the idea that there could one day be a version of Algeria or Sudan where the military does not have overarching veto power over every foreign policy or over social spending. Right? Or a scenario where military spending would actually come under the review of an elected parliamentary body, which we take for granted in a democracy, but it's anathema in countries ruled by militaries. And so I think that for many of these activists, they realize it's actually a multi-stage process. Stage one, get out on the street, pressure your leaders, demand democracy, demand justice, demand dignity. And even if the ruler seats power, that's not enough then elections will happen. Mobilize for elections, organize into parties, form movements, form something people can vote for. Right? Because if you don't do that, then all the gains of your contemporary moment of change will be lost. Uh, we call this sort of the May 1968 contradiction. Uh, some of you who've studied history know what happened, the famous May 1968 revolutionary moment around the world, particularly in France, when a mass uprising of workers and students paralyzed the French political system in May 1968. Charles de Gaulle, president of France, fled to a NATO base in Germany, thinking he had just lost power. 
That's how bad it got in France. That's how closely the left in France thought it had won. A compromise was made, President de Gaulle came back in the country, and the streets settled down. Students and workers thought they had won. And do you know what happened in the June 1968 French elections? Biggest victory for conservative parties in French history, right? Because students and workers had believed the work was done. And I think that the activists of the Arab world today know we're not going to understand they're not going to fall into that trap ever again, right? Not in Egypt, not in Tunisia. That organizing is the hard part of, activist, of activism in many ways, right? Protesting is the exciting, glorious part, but organizing is where the rubber meets the road. Thank you so much. I, that was a great answer. <laughs> I just had to say that. Um, yeah, so thank you, Nada, for your question um, and for allowing me to speak more about my favorite topic ever, uh, feminist movements in the Arab world, particularly in Tunisia. Um, yeah, how did they do it? I think, uh, going back to your question, Nada, I think, and you mentioned the UGTT and other forces in Tunisia, I think people tend to think, not just about Tunisia, but about um, many of those cases and others around the world, that there's only one factor or one party that creates the change, or that it's more effective than the other. Um, definitely, the UGTT, and for those of you who are not familiar with Tunisia, the, U, the UGTT is the, um, is the Union Federation, the Federation of Tunisian Unions for Workers, for Laborers and Professions. It's a very, very strong body, uh, political body, um, one that had gained uh, semi-independent independence from the state since the Bourguiba uh, times in the late 1970s and they had been along with the uh, Tunisian civil society often credit with the success of Tunisia the success of the democratic transition in 2014 um, the women's rights movement really in Tunisia is very peculiar because it exists across many of these organizations so the women's rights movement is not just the women's rights organizations that we know, like the UNFTT, which is the Union for um, the Femme Democrat or the uh, Democratic Women of Tunisia, which is one of the oldest women's rights NGOs that plays a huge role there. So the women, what the women's rights movement did, and I wish I had more time, I had some slides, but I didn't want to take more of your time. I think what they did was very, very clever because they did exactly what Sean was talking about. They decided that they needed to enter politics. So what the women's rights movement did there is that they organized electoral leagues, for example. Uh, associations and, uh, sorry, networks of women working door to door to encourage people to vote for secular parties in particular, but for parties that support women's rights. They lobbied, a lot of them ran for elections and they were, uh, two or three of them were the representatives of the women's rights movement within the um, the Constitutive Assembly, which is the constitution that wrote the, the, um, the body, the assembly that wrote the 2014 constitution. And those women, for example, along with women's in the parliament and outside, lobbied so much for the parity clause that I mentioned that was included as part of the constitution, right? So there were women who entered politics and they entered politics in labor politics with the UGTT. They entered women uh, politics within the electoral politics, whether as candidates or as uh, people who organize elections. And I think, I still think that those legacies that I was talking about and their ability to frame it in a way after the uprising, in a very clever, I think, and savvy way, enabled them to do that. So they were actually politicians. They were not, which, which I think what women's rights movement should do, right? They should, you should try to enter politics and influence it, right? I mean, <laughs> we need to do that right here, right, right now. So I think, and I think, yeah, and going off what Chanwa said, I think, for example, the women's rights movement in Tunisia was a success, a successful case of what uh, Sean had just said, along with the labor movement as well. And I don't think it's a coincidence even with the current state of Tunisian politics, which I know we're all worried about. But even with the current state of Tunisian politics, I think it's not a coincidence that Tunisia emerged as the only democratic state in the region because they were able to do this hard work of organizing for politics, whether women or uh, other, other parties. Okay, thank, thank you so much. So I will ask you, but you don't need to uh, answer me right now. Uh, because of time constraint, maybe it will come in the discussion. So the first question is for Dr. Yom, 
And they want to ask you about legitimacy of the political power that has been a contested terrain and the ground for distrust and disconnect between the masses and their political leaders in the country of the MENA region. So there is no legitimacy and there is no trust. Political Islam that was repressed under the pre-Arab Spring regimes was perceived as the legitimate alternative. Ten years of power, they have eroded much of it, its legitimacy. Jews see this as the end of political Islam, as the legitimate alternative. Jews see a path for the emergence of new viable alternatives. Um, and the second uh, question is for uh, Dr. Ahmed Zaki. And I think I will stay with the Islamists so you can build on each other. Um, let me uh, go to, uh, wait, okay. So um, as you talked, uh, you said that in the 19th century, we have seen the emergence of secular uh, feminism. In the 20th century, we have witnessed the, the rise of Islamic feminism. While these two movements target different sites of power for change, they both aim to improve gender agency. Do you see them as complementary, one to the other, or do you think that they are a threat, one to the other? Can they collaborate together? Or are their ideological differences irreconcilable? Okay, and thank you. The answer to both questions is no. Next question. <laughs> um, look, I uh, uh, so, so for the, the I, let me just engage the second question. Um, I mean, it, it would be logical, I think, to imagine that in an ideal world, but there are just so many deeply embedded historical and emotional and I think rightfully founded political reasons why grassroots movements in the Arab world uh, do not see Israel as an iconic example of democratic achievement. One is that um, many people like myself believe that it's not, <laughs> uh, given, you know, given it's multi, essentially a multi-tiered system of, of, of domestic citizenship. And secondly, um, as long as the Palestinian crisis is all is 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 is, is festering, and and it, and and it's 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 a multifaceted problem that has as much to do with the international community and, frankly, a number of Middle East governments as well, and not just Israel. As long as the Palestinian crisis remains an an evocative. Uh, a problem in the minds of many people in the Arab world, uh, they would never consider the political order of Israel to be something to be emulated. Um, and I just don't see those two sites ever converging, um, at least not for the next generation. Um, I will also say, 
Amel, uh, to your question. Um, I think that it's, uh, I, I would agree with you that I, there are no ideological alternatives now to rulers that lack legitimacy. I don't think that, I mean, I, I think that national parties, the era of national party states is over. I think the FLN will never be what it once was in Algeria. No one believes in the Ba'ath anymore in Syria. Um, now it's all just a personalistic clique led by Bashar Assad. So uh, there is no national party state ideology, but at the same time, monarchies also don't imbue the kind of enduring symbolic legitimacy you'd expect them to. Maybe accepting Morocco, because there I know the relationship between the Alawis, uh, the, 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 the Alawite monarchy and, and ordinary Moroccans is different given you know, the king is Amir al-Mu'manin and commander of the faithful and has significant religious authority. But even monarchies struggle with legitimacy. I mean, in, in more monarchies than not during the Arab Spring, people said, you're part of the you're part of the crowd. We want you out. And so I think just right now we are looking at the emergence of viable alternatives that are non-Islamist, uh, but are not leftist either. And I don't know what they are, but I think the current generation of activists, this is what they're fighting for. I think that the old left is too weak in most countries to mount a challenge. I also think that whether it's their fault or not, Islamism as a political alternative just has too many bruises on its institutional body to merit a popular alternative for the you know first year activist in a place like Jordan um, and or Morocco. And so I think we're just gonna have to wait to see what grassroots indigenous models of governance come up that go beyond the current authoritarian social contracts. Okay, um, I'm gonna start by Trying to answer your question as well, just adding uh, something to what Sean would said, which I, comp I, I agree with Sean a lot about what he said. But I want to say that there was a moment uh, back in the late 1970s, uh, and I'm particularly speaking you know, during the time of the peace process, when I think some Arabs, I'm not saying a vast majority, would look up to Israel. And I think Israel itself was a very different place back then. Um, I think we need to put into... Uh, into our idea is that Israel itself had backslided in terms of democracy. And this is something that Israeli activists themselves are talking about, Israeli leftist activists, not just Arabs. Um, so I think there was a time, I, th I think Israel is really, ironically, even despite the protocrated Arab-Israeli conflict, is becoming part of the region in the sense that we are seeing authoritarian backsliding happening in Israel itself. And we are seeing a backsliding of women's rights. And I have a lot of Israeli leftist friends, feminist friends, who would, part, who would exactly say what I'm saying right now, is that women's rights themselves are very much backsliding. Um, we see a lot of religious influence on women's rights, particularly in personal status quo. We're actually seeing very similar things in Israel to what is going on in the rest of the Arab world. So instead of the Arab world looking up to Israel, I think Israel <laughs> is, is sliding into authoritarianism and a lot of things. So it's, it's actually unfortunate that this is happening, I, in, my, in my humble opinion. Um, so uh, as for your question, uh, uh, thank you so much for this question. And I think it's a very, very important one. Um, I have a lot to say about the distinction between Islamic and secular feminism, particularly if we look at the history of feminism in the region. And I really do think that and I don't want to sound like I am brushing over the differences because the differences are real, right? But I also think that the history, if we, if we do a more careful reading of the history of Arab feminism in the late 19th century and early 20th century, we will see less of a difference on the question of Islam. Like all of, all of the most, okay, who is the most, who are the ones who are seen as the most township secular Arab feminist? Now, Al Sadewi, right? who was obviously the Egyptian feminist, the late Egyptian feminist who just passed away, who was obviously, of course, not a religious person, but she dealt with Islam. Like, she talked a lot about religion, right? And she talked about religion as being, um, like, that we should advocate for better interpretation. Like, feminists, whether they call themselves secular or Islamists, had no choice but to engage with religion because the bulk of the personal status law and the bulk of the religious system that deals with women's rights has some kind of background or has some kind, is based somehow on some interpretation of Islam. So I don't think any 
feminist in the region, no matter how secular she wants to think she is, can actually avoid the question of dealing with Islam. How we tend to deal with Islam, or, or how we situate ourselves vis-a-vis -vis Islamic law, vis-a-vis -vis Sharia, or whether we choose not to talk about it and focus more on politics, as I was saying, what the feminist in Tunisia or other parts of the region are doing is a different question. But I think it's very difficult, for me at least, to have this distinct, like, this is an Islamic feminist, this is uh, a secular feminist. And, I, and I'm using, I would use the figure exhibition A for this, Fatima Marnisi. Again, a Moroccan feminist, one of the most important and well-known Arab feminist, sociologist, and thinker, who would call herself at times an Islamic feminist. And if you read her writings, she was absolutely someone who was invested in the reform of Islam to make it more, you know, all of these things. So I, I kind of, I feel wary about the split. I think it's more when we, when we enter the realm of politics, like the story I was saying about Tunisia. Yes, of course, there are women who would call themselves feminist, and they are part of a Nahda. Yes, there are women who would, at least, they would call themselves the weather. And then there are women who would call themselves feminist, and they are part of the secular parties, right? And they understand, maybe they understand women's rights in very different terms, right? Politically. But I, I doubt that we can have this label, I think, used to be, like the distinction used to be clearer, I don't think it was ever clear. Like, people think of it as a clear distinction. I'm very skeptical of this very strict split, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so I just want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to thank Nada and Amel for, and Jess for all of your organizing of this event. Um, and let me make a quick announcement. Um, there's another Global Teach Connect event. I'm just going to read the synopsis, um, and Joyce Pittman can tell you more about it afterwards if you have questions. Under the patronage of HE... Eng Hussein Ibrahim Al Hamadi, the Minister of Education. It is our pleasure to invite you to join us for the fifth Abu Dhabi, I think it is, uh, educational forum, reimagining education virtually organized by Abu Dhabi University in collaboration with the Regional Center for Educational Planning and UNESCO and the Queen Rania Teacher Academy QRTA. And you'll hear from a range of international experts. Um, it's an online virtual event. If you're interested, Joyce is here. You can ask her questions and get the uh, link and information. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to our speakers.